Okay, so The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Episode 6 is now out, and this ending explained is going to break down that finale. Titled The Last Time, it's packed with easter eggs, things that hint towards where we could be going, and also a lot of stuff to unpack. Throughout this video, we're going to be going through it all, and also giving our thoughts on the series as a whole. So come with me on a mission to get through The Ones Who Live, and please hit the thumbs up if you've enjoyed the breakdowns. Make sure you subscribe for videos like this almost every day as we go through all the A's and B's of your favourite franchises. Without the way, thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into the ones who live. Are we crazy? Certifiable. Now last week we saw Jadis catching up with Rick and Michonne, and on her death cushion, she revealed where she'd hid the file. Throughout the series, we learn that she'd caught them in 4K, and info on Alexandria was hidden in her room. In the event of her untimely death, this would then be found and lead to the location being destroyed. Plus, Michonne's just realised those fucks gotta go, so the pair headed back to the CRM. They're now engaged, about to be enraged, and hitting up Cascade, dear. But I'm not a rapper. Now, we've had teases throughout the series about the big echelon briefing, in which all the heads are gonna get together. This is something that happens in the episode with us finally learning the truth of what's going on, and that should be fully caught up. And that takes us into episode 6. Now we begin with a little love nest and some quotes from the show, with the first of these having Rick before we cut into Michonne's interview. From there we jump to the CRM, next we have Okafor, and then Jadis, Nat, and lastly Beale. Not only do the quotes chronicle the season, but the items we catch on the table do as well. For example, as the tasty noodles from last week, and the map from the escape plan. There's also a bottle of black label and two glasses, which calls back to Jadis' arrival in the show. This kind of felt like a symbolic scene of the pair together, but I liked how it worked literally as well. It ends with a proposal, which is how we closed out last week, and we then cut to Rick and Michonne kissing as they go through the plan. Now if you're wondering how they got the clothing back, well I'm pretty sure that Michonne's wearing Jadis' armour. You can catch the three stripes on her arm, which Jadis also had last week. We then cut to Rick, rolling in like his name's Astley. In the voiceover, he talks about the burning, and fires semi hats appeared repeatedly throughout the season. Last week, we talked about all the instances, so I don't just want to rehash that, and you should have been here if you don't know what I'm talking about, but fire is something that's symbolically shown up time and time again. Rick's farm story was about how his father burned the crops in order to start again, which is something that they end up doing with the CRM. Back at base, Thorne can't believe he's back, and he states Michonne pushed him out of the helicopter and saved him. As we know, this ended up crashing, but I felt like it was on a symbolic level as well. Michonne saved Rick from being stuck in this trap, but it's clear that Thorne wants to remain in it. She talks about how giving up can be a strength, and it shows how submissive people can become for safety. This is something that we've seen in real life, with several social studies showing that people will often give up freedom in order to be safe. Whether it's governments having more surveillance over the population, or monitoring messages, we all go with it because deep down people believe it's going to protect them. Rick almost fell victim to that too, and Thorne sees herself as belonging because she's been promised power. Now I've actually been rereading Children of Dune, and there was a passage in it that I think lines up pretty well with why the CRM killed the A's. It talked about how when there's an oppressive government, that all rebellion has to be stamped out quickly. If leaders manage to establish themselves, then people will follow them, and this has a knock-on effect that will lead to those in power being ousted. If you're a leadership and you don't have any other leaders, then there's no one else for the population to follow. Therefore, people have to remain loyal to you because you're their only option. Just thought I'd talk about that because I know that there is a lot of people confused over the whole killing the A's thing, but that passage stood out to me and made sense in the context of this show. Also, I get to talk about June again, which any excuse, I'll bloody take it. Now outside, we see Michonne stealthing her way in and doing parkour to get through the defences. Arriving at Jadis' room, she finds the info inside a metal cat, which is of course what Jadis used to make with the scavengers. This is similar to the one that Michonne got for Carl, and it also highlights certain things about Jadis. Jadis, or rather Anne, this was the true side of her, and Anne was the good side who wanted to be an artist. I think putting Alexandria inside this shows it was close to her heart, and it's clear that she didn't stop thinking about the colony. We of course also have that picture of Gabriel, and it highlights the other side to her. This went out in the end, and she told Rick and Michonne where the secret was hidden, rather than dying and dooming them to destruction. Not like they needed to find it in the end anyway, because everyone gets killed and the CRM completely changed their policy, so side plot looking back was a bit pointless. Now the arrival of Gabriel last week had people going back through the timeline to see if my guy had cheated on Rosita. 
tried desperately to find the tweet going through everything, but there was a user who worked it all out. They said that Gabriel hadn't cheated, and this is because Rosita died one day before retirement, and then after this we had a time jump of one year. Due to Michonne mentioning how long she was in the mall, or, or Rick saying how long he was at the CRM, we know there's also been a couple of years to add to it. So technically, the kiss happened after her death, so no guys, he didn't cheat. I'm glad it was you in the end. I'm glad I was here in the end. Whoa, 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 what, what, what do you mean by that, Rosita? Don't die, don't, bloody hell, don't die on Eugene. I'm glad I was here in the end. <laughs> now we'll talk later on about how I think Gabriel could be brought back down the line, but I think his return was done for a reason. And we find Beale reflecting Rick from the start of the season with him protecting the wall. He also refers to him and Rick as the dead, calling back to Rick's famous speech from the show. That we are the walking dead. Beale to me sort of represents the future that Rick could have if he chose to have an insulated view. The idea of Beale being an opposite to the Alexandrians is also shown in Jadis' room. He's on the other side of the pillar to Gabriel and both represent the two choices that Jadis could have taken. Now in a similar sort of scene set up to what we've had in the series, we have Beale looking at the camera and explaining things to the audience. We've had this long stare down in several of our characters, with it being one of my favourite directorial choices in the show. Here Beale asks what the worst thing Rick's ever done is, with us getting flashes of a murdering Shane and tearing a guy's throat out. Personally, I believe it was him leaving the show, because some of them seasons after mate, they were, they were a bit rough. Now Beale's here to give him the echelon briefing, and he wants him on sheaths the sword from the Revolutionary War. Belonging to Mercer, this was a man who was famous for saving a city. Mercer died, but Beale said earlier in the season that he believed he was on the right side. This is something he brought up with Okafor, and it of course reflects what Beale's trying to do this season. He then goes into his past and talks about how he fought in Vietnam, which is another loss that may set up how he views warfare. Beale thinks the message, and how it changes the world, is more important than the victory, and thus he doesn't mind taking the L's. He sacrifices home in Pittsburgh in order to save Philly, and he understands sacrifice. Rick recounts the farm story, but we also saw him cutting off his hand in order to escape. I think that metaphorically, this is what the season's about, with them being willing to get rid of something in order to go forward. Now from this point we see Michonne picking up a stuffed bunny, which is something that's appeared throughout the show. There's big theories about what they really mean, I won't go into theory time, uh, but Lydia, Gracie and Judith, they've all had one, with the same Etsy store owner even making them for the show. It's thought that they're meant to be a sign of innocence that children possess. This is why Michonne remembers her kids at this point, and it highlights the future that they're fighting for. However, the way the CRM want to use kids is more like a resource, and it's clear that the ones who live will be forced into their civilization. Now, scientists predict that humans have 14 years left to live before things come to a close. However, in the end, the CRM seem like they're going to be helping people, which might actually allow humanity to thrive. They have the full might and resources of what's left of the military, and can now use this to go out and protect. That's originally what the army should have done, and we know from fear that there was at least an attempt at it. However, Okafor showed that the army were going in to kill the humans, and thus he ended up killing them. I think the fact that the CRM also wanted to destroy major cities is probably what made him start going against them and putting his own team in place. Still a lot about him that we never got cleared up, but let me know below exactly what you think. Now, this map shows Portland, which according to the World Beyond wiki has 87,000 people there. World Beyond had survivors going there to warn them an attack was coming, and we know this show set after that. You see, Jay disappeared at the end of it, and with her death being in the show, it straightens out the timeline. But this city's supposed to be part of the Alliance of the Three, which is teamed with Philadelphia and Omaha. As we know though, the CRM attacked Omaha, which went against their joint protection agreement. Now it's all just about evacuating the kids so there's a future, and then destroying the city so the greater whole can go on. It's pretty chilling, but Rick refuses to leave people behind, and thus Beale's gotta go. It's all false flag attacks, and again, another comment on government and how manipulative those in power can be. Rick knows long term that Alexandria will be hit though, and they'll either be killed or forced into their ranks. Thus he ends up taking down Beale, adding to a long line of people that have been cut in the show. I kind of feel like Beale should have had guards on the door or something, but no. Also, I really wanted Michonne to sword fight Beale. Anyway, Rick triumphantly says he's not dead, which is a line he's repeated throughout the show, going against his last speech. Trying to sneak his body out, it all ends up kicking off after he reunites with Michonne. 
creating an uninspired explosive, the pair end up with a thorn in their side. Here they head out to the meeting, and you can catch blue and green canisters in the back. These actually appeared in the credits right at the start, and I had been wondering for a while what they were, so it's nice they finally clear this up. Thorn also heads out searching for them, and on a whiteboard we can catch a line that says PPP exception. This is a nod to the Triple P card, which has been one of the big mysteries in the show. This was first introduced back in Season 7 Episode 6, with Tara coming across it. It then appeared in Tales of the Walking Dead, and has been a big mystery in the franchise. Gimple's tease that we will learn about how this all ties together eventually, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think it could be. Due to it being an exception, it could also highlight there's another hierarchy in the CRM. I do feel like there's other stuff out there, and it'll be interesting to see just how they continue to develop them in side stories. Using Beale and the guard from the lift, they create an improvised explosive timer, but as they make a run for it, Thorn then shows up. Throughout the series, we've been predicting that it would come down to this, with it sort of playing off the scene from episode 1. However, I felt like it was going to be a choice where she allowed them to escape, and this is because it reminded her of who she had out in the world. She turned her back on that person, which I think would have closed out her arc well, but they just had it so she was shocked at Beale being dead. I think she just represents someone who's given up on love, and how that hope is ultimately what lost it for her in the end. She does say that Beale was wrong, but I felt like they could have done a bit more writing wise, even though the performance was pretty good. No idea how that tank thing saved them from the explosion though, and yeah, gonna need some science person in the comments to explain how they're still alive. Think that, think that armor they're wearing might be plot armor, eh? And that goes for the grenade rick pulls and the gas, because earlier in the season that was burning people's eyes, and yeah, I, I just felt it was a little bit inconsistent. Now at this point we get a broadcast voiceover explain the CRM's changed its policy and that people can come and go freely. This completely changes the demeanour of the CRM, but whether it's good or bad remains to be seen. The scientists of course predicted humanity didn't have very long, and it's going to be interesting to see if they manage to rebuild the world. We get some memorabilia, and also the name Taito, which was of course the card word that Judith and Michonne used. And the pair end up going back to Alexandria in, in like, name only. I think they probably ran out of budget at this point, and just had to film it in a field rather than going to the location. What really matters though, is Rick's being united with his kids, and not only is he back with Judith, but he also gets to meet RJ. He's someone who built him up as a hero in his mind, but Rick's gone back and forth over whether he lives up to this. Cole, of course, still hangs heavily over the character, and I think with RJ, he can find somewhat redemption. He was the one that Rick did terrible things for, and though he couldn't save him, he could save RJ. Also, yeah, you forget how quickly kids grow up in it. I looked at a video from mine last year, and DM me, time flies, mate. It was a powerful reunion, though, and RJ rocked his dad's hat, with well, that, of course, being like Cole too. He says he knew he'd come back because he believed, and this of course builds off the back of the Believe a Little Longer saying that was etched into the phones. And that closes out the series as the chopper takes their aid to other communities. Going forward, I feel like these side seasons are probably setting something up big, and that eventually we'll get an Avengers style team up. For example, the Daryl Dixon show's got a season 2, and that's going to be dropping at some point in the summer. Norman Reedus confirmed this on his Instagram story, and he also revealed the title of the season. That's going to be called The Book of Carol, and no prizes for guessing who's going to show up in that. You might remember that originally the first season was going to be the pair, but Melissa McBride ended up dropping out. However, it looks like the band's getting back together, which I think teases at what's going to be coming. Personally, I believe we're going to be getting all these spin-off shows before a big final one where everybody teams up. That's why I feel Gabriel was brought back, and it teases that Alexandria is going to return too. Will be interesting to see if we get a final, 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 final season of The Walking Dead that finally pulls the whole thing together. I think in general, right, I think that it's a bit difficult to end zombie related properties, which we tend to see in a lot of different films. Pretty much all zombie movies close out up and ended because it's difficult to close things out properly. Only one I can fully think of was 28 Days Later, but even that got opened up with a sequel, so I think they're probably going to build to that and then finally be like, we'll stop the dead reanimating, the world can return. Just depends on how much they want to milk it out for, and how much of the audience remains. Obviously, let me know below what you think, but as for my thoughts on the season, you know what, I enjoyed it. The spin-offs have been kind of hit and miss for me, and though I've kept up on them, they've not been must-watch for me. That's why I didn't bother doing the show from the jump, but that first episode really got me on board. I still don't think the series quite managed to recapture the high of that, though we did have a lot of good moments. I do think the first half of the season was stronger than the latter part though, and that, I'm still being like, Nat was the Don. 
I think the season was kind of weird, and as of making this breakdown, they haven't announced the season 2 yet, but I think there was a lot of hesitation when they were putting this together. It kind of feels like they wanted to do a season 2, and maybe put things in place where the CRM would be the big bad. I could even have seen Beale becoming that too, and have all the heroes have to team up to beat him. Felt like they were going that way as well, but then they didn't know if they'd be getting another go. So they didn't really want to leave it open-ended, but also didn't really have enough time to give us a killer CRM story with Rick and Michonne. I think they dropped the ball a bit with how things wrapped up, you know, it was a big waste of Beale's character, and to me it was a weaker finale to close out what had been a strong show. We see this happening a lot with these six episode series as well, and obviously a lot of the Disney stuff's been victim to it too. But yeah, there are things to to like personally, and I think overall, you know, though the finale let me down, this probably is still my favourite of the spin-offs so far. I don't know looking back on it if it's going to be one that I highly recommend, um, but if you're still interested in the direction that they're going, obviously I think it might be worth you checking out just to see how things happen with Rick. Obviously, I'd also love to hear what you think on it, so let me know below your thoughts on the series. Please drop a like on the video, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. You get early access to videos every week for just 99 cents a month, which goes a massive way to helping us out. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, we've also got our t-shirt line below the video, and that will let you pick up all kinds of tops like our Theory Time 1, Me and the Boys, House of Dragons stuff, Marvel Tees, and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too, so definitely keep an eye out and thanks for your support. Now if you want some else to watch, you've got a breakdown on screen right now, so definitely head over there right after this. But out of the way, thank you for sticking through the video, I've been your host Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.